So we were going through this uh, design problem and uh, we were talking um, about the uh, pressure drop, right? At uh, this point, we have calculated the overall heat transfer coefficient with all the assumptions we have made uh, in terms of the tube, si tube size specifications and uh, also the velocities, right? We double the velocity in the tubes at this point. Uh, but we need to check because we made this change in the velocity we need to check the pressure drop, right? We cannot just change the velocity like that without looking at the constraints in the pressure drop. So that is a step 12. Um, check the pressure drop uh, in the tube side first. So we already established that we are going to use 240 tubes, four passes, and this is the inner diameter of the tubes we are employing. And the velocity already doubled uh, is 2.3 meters per second. So we need to recalculate, right, or get the Reynolds. Um, so I think, uh, let me double check, yeah, we need to get the Reynolds. But in order to get the delta P, in this case, we are going to use equation 1220. So if you can locate that equation, 1220 for the pressure drop in the tube side is in the same chapter. Uh, in the same textbook chapter, uh, you will see that this equation of the delta P inside the tubes requires a correction factor, again, JF. Um, so this correction factor, we can get it from figure 12.24. 12 so let's look at that figure so we can check how to read um, that figure. So first of all, uh, figure 12.24. Uh, and um, 1224 delta P. Okay, we, we already calculated the overall heat transfer coefficient and you have the equation here. And um, I'm sure you are very familiar with this equation is the sum of all the resistances, right? So not, not a big deal, but you have it there as a reminder in the, in the textbook chapter. So this is equation 1220 that we are going to use following this method for designing heat exchangers for calculating the pressure drop in the tube side. As it is evident, um, we need uh, this uh, friction factor, JF, in this textbook uh, in order to get uh, the delta P in the tube, in the tube side. So, um, we need to know also the number of tube side passes here, the tube side velocity that we already established, right? And the length of the tubes that we already established. Um, another pressure, another source of pressure drop will be the flow expansion and contraction at the exchanger inlet and outlet nozzles. Uh, this can be estimated by adding one velocity head for the inlet and 0.5 for the outlet based on the nozzle velocities. So that is another thing that we might need to take in account. So, and we will do later in the next step. So let's for now get the friction factor to calculate delta P with equation 1220 uh, for the tube side. And we already said that our Reynolds number is going to be, or with the values given of the velocity, the diameter, we have 8.7, 10 to the three, right? So we are more or less here in this area. Uh, there's only one line, so you don't even need to choose for other. Uh, so we go all the way to the left and we can get a friction factor for the tube side of five, 10 to the minus three, right? So everyone was able to read a number similar to that one. I know these, these graphs are not like very easy to read, uh, but, um, uh, is is the best graphs I could find, and this is a very well I mean well known textbook for design. So um, these graphs so far are very accurate. Okay, so once we have the friction factor in the tube side, we can put numbers in our equation right for the uh, for the delta p uh, using equation 1220, and if we convert to bars to compare with the limiting pressure that is allowed in this problem, we can check that the delta P in the tube sides is 1.4 bars. 
this is um, allowed or not according to the design required. Yeah, that's correct. So it is not allowed because the problem statement says that the pressure drop permissible in both the streams is 0.8 bars. So it exceeds the specification required. So we need to return to step six and modify the design. So we need to go uh, back to step six and redo everything until this step. And again, this all of this is what I need that you show in your design. Every single iteration, every single uh, step that you need to go back, you need to put uh, their detailed calculations on the new step, okay? Uh, so let's modify the design then. So the tube velocity needs to be reduced. Why? Because it impacts directly the delta P, right? Velocity impacts directly the delta P. So the velocity, the tube velocity needs to be reduced. This, this will reduce the heat transfer coefficient, so the number of tubes must be increased to compensate. There will be a pressure drop across the inlet and outlet of the nozzles, and we saw that in the equation 1220, right? It says that allow also delta P for the nozzles. So allow 0.1 bar for this, a typical figure about 15% of the total. So if you multiply 0.8, that is the permissible bars, times 0.15 gives you point, around 0.12, right? That will leave around 0.7 bars across the tubes from 0.8 total that it was required in the design, right? So that is where this 0.7 comes from. Again, this is a typical figure, an approximation. So you as a designer, you are free to say, I want to consider 0.6 or 0.8 bars, okay? Just because I'm going to over-design or I'm going to be a little bit lower of the permissible value. That's completely up to you. And uh, it's something that you will gain um, these kind of decisions or, um, uh, yeah, informed decisions or educated decisions uh, are going to be better as uh, much practice you have in design of heat exchangers. So pressure drop is, is roughly proportional to the square of the velocity, and the velocity in the tubes is proportional to the number of tubes per pass. So the pressure drop calculated for 240 passes can be used to estimate the number of tubes required. So let's recalculate the number of tubes required. So tubes needed, we already established 240, right, in previous pages. So this number is the previous number of tubes that we said that we are going to require. Mult or divided by 0.6, that is the point, this 0.7 bar that we calculated with the 15% that is going to be um, lived in the, across the tube the author of the book decides to use only 0.6 of those bars. And this depends completely on you. You can use 0.6, you can use 0.7, you can say, I'm going to use 0.75. Uh, this is just a value that is going to give you an idea, but the final decision will be depending on you. It's, what, it's exactly the same thing we do, like when we select also fooling resistances, right? We have a range of fooling resistances, but some of you will say, I'm going to read the highest value of fooling resistances, I'm going to use the lower value, I'm going to use an average. That depends on the designer completely. So this, in here, the author is using 0.6 bars to distribute across the tubes. Divided by the pressure drop calculated for the 240 tubes in the previous step or in the previous steps, okay? So uh, to the 0.5, this is equal to 365 tubes. So that's how we do a new approximation of the new number of tubes that can help us to accommodate the 0.8 bars required in the design. Again, this is up to you how many tubes you are going to use. Here, the author decides for 360. You can say, okay, 365, I'm going to use 370. Okay, that's completely up to you. 
uh, with four passes. So we are maintaining four passes. Retain four passes as the heat transfer coefficient will be too low with two passes. So we retain the same four passes, but we are uh, increasing the number of tubes from 240 to 360. So let's do the second trial design. Remember, we, we go back to, um, to step six. Uh, so second trial, everything is going to be the, the same, the outer diameter of the tube, the inner diameter of the tube, the length of the tube. So we are not changing the tubes we selected or the organization of the tubes. We keep triangular pitch also. What is going to change? The number of tubes only. But since the number of tubes changes, now we need to recalculate the bundle diameter, recalculate the clearance, recalculate the cross-sectional area per pass, the tube velocity, the Reynolds, and uh, read again the correction factors for the nozzle and get the new H value. So this is just a, a complete repetition of the step six, of, or from step six, sorry. So this could be how you read your new uh, clearance, right? Uh, for the bundle diameter, now that we have a new bundle diameter. Um, the calculation of the bundle diameter uh, remains essentially the same because we are keeping the four passes and the triangular pitch. So our constants K1 and N1 remain the same. What is going to change is the number of tubes. So essentially we are using the same equation as we did before, but changing here the total number of tubes. That's the, the only thing is gonna essentially change from the new calculation. However, since we now have a new bundle diameter, right? We need to calculate again the clearance space for a split ring floating head. We are not changing that, that remains the same. So, and uh, that will give us a value of around 59 millimeters here. Right, that is what the book is showing. Uh, is showing it here. That's the clearance that we are reading from the uh, from the figure. Uh, Cross-sectional area pi d squared over four. Why we have this extra four here? Yeah, because there are four two passes, and we are calculating cross-sectional area per pass, right? Uh, now that we have the cross-sectional area, right, and we know the volumetric flow rate, we divide volumetric flow rate by cross-sectional area, give us the tube velocity. Now that we have the tube velocity, we are ready for the Reynolds, right? Um, so we have the crude, the density of the crude at the average temperature that we have from step two, where we collected all the different uh, properties of the fluid. We have the tube velocity that we just calculated in here. We have the inner diameter size, and we have the viscosity here of the crude oil at the mean temperature, again, from a step two, where we collected all our uh, properties. So that's very important that you make a very robust and clear uh, table of properties in your design, because you all the time will come back to this table. Um, L over D, or the ratio L over D, we are going to keep it the same. Why? Why the L over, over D ratio stays the same as the first trial? We haven't changed the diameter of the length of the tubes, right? We keep the same tubes. We just change the number of tubes. Um, so again, we need to go to figure 1223 to find this JH correction factor and calculate then the, um, the heat transfer coefficient. So in figure, um, that's figure uh, 1223. Remember we are iterating. We have a new Reynolds. We have the same LD, LL over D because we maintain constant in the tubes specifications. So we go all the way to the left side and we have a new heat transfer factor. Um, that our new transfer factor is 3.6 10 to the minus three. So we are going to use that one, right? to recalculate age. Um, so we have um, the equation for age is again 1215. We are just repeating the steps, right? And uh, we have a, a value of 680 watt meter square Celsius. Um, the book says this looks satisfactory, uh, but anyway, whatever this, this number looks like, you need to 
to check the pressure drop. That's a very important thing to do. Again, we go back to figure 1224 and get the friction factor so we can calculate the delta P in the tube and see if we are within the specification. So friction factor for the tube side, again, we have everything to read that, um, that friction factor here, right, from our second trial design. So delta P, same equation, right? Uh, we have the Reynolds, we go all the way to the left and we have a friction factor for the tube side of 5.5, 10 to the minus three. We recalculate the delta P uh, in the tube sites and we have 0.66 bars. So it worked. Um, it work is within a specification, right? We have a pressure drop of 0.8 permissible. So we are fine. So this is just the delta P of the tube sites. We are missing the delta P of the shell. So we can see that it is also within the 0.8 range because the problem says both of them should not exceed, the shell and the tube should not exceed uh, the 0.8. So we are keeping the same baffle cut and baffle spacing. We are going to calculate the, uh, the surface area, right? Uh, we have the tube pitch here. We have here the outer diameter. We have the shell inside diameter here. And uh, we have a baffle spacing of 100. This baffle spacing, we specify it in page 687 and we are, maintaining both the baffle cut and the baffle spacing the same. So that doesn't change. Then we calculate the volumetric, sorry, the velocity, the velocity in the shell size with the volumetric flow rate and the area we calculated. We calculate again the hydraulic diameter of the shell as we did before. Um, remember, this is just an iteration and we get a new Reynolds number, right? With this hydraulic diameter, this velocity here. Um, again, we calculate the Brandt, um, and we have the equations for the Brandt and the Reynolds. Um, if I remember correctly, I already specified to you, it's in page 663 where we have the Reynolds and Brandt equations. We need to use figures 1229 and 1230 in your handouts. Uh, so we can calculate this, this um, the heat transfer factor and the um, and the um, the friction factor and the friction factor. So we can calculate the uh, heat transfer coefficient in the shell side and the delta p in the shell side. So we can go to those tables. So well, this is the surface area. Uh, that we use for the um, for already calculate the hydraulic diameter and the velocity in the shell. Uh, so we have a new Reynolds number, the baffle code. We are going to maintain the same, and we already saw this figure because we are in second trial. Point uh, twenty five. We read a heat transfer factor of four four point eight ten to the minus three. We need the friction factor too. So friction factor again, the Reynolds. Uh, the same baffle cut that we have been maintaining, the 25% cut, and we have a friction factor of 4.6, 10 to the minus two. So uh, here we have the equation, right, that we are using for the shell size, uh, for delta P and for the nozzles also. So those are the equations 1225 and 1226 uh, that we are using in here. So, we have a delta P, finally, after calculating the H value of 1.2 bars. Again, it's higher than the specified um, because we are only allowed to have 0.8 overall, 0.8 in the shell, 0.8 in the uh, tubes. So we need to check the overall heat transfer coefficient to see if there's room to modify the shell side design. Um, why we have to check the overall heat transfer coefficient? Because we have included there the H value for the shell, right? 
the uh, convectivity transfer coefficient for the for the for the shell side. So let's recalculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. So the overall heat transfer coefficient is going to be um, one over this is the tube side heat transfer coefficient, right? Times the full in factor of the crude side that it was given, and if not, you can get from tables, times the outside diameter of the tube, inside diameter of the tube. Again, we have here the diameters of the tubes here, two times 55, that is the thermal conductivity of the stainless steel. Um, sorry, in this case, we use a carbon steel, not stainless steel. Um, plus um, one over the shell side heat transfer coefficient that we calculated here, right? Plus uh, the kerosene uh, stream full in factor, this value that was given. Uh, we have a, a value of 302 watt meter squared per Celsius. Let's calculate the um, overall heat transfer coefficient value required from our uh, similar to Newton's cooling law equation. Overall heat transfer coefficient is the duty or heat transfer rate times the area, right, divided by, divided by the area and delta T log. The area is something that we can calculate, right? The delta T log we already calculated in previous steps. We know the duty, so we can cal cal calculate this overall heat transfer coefficient required. Uh, how we calculate the area? A naught is the number of tubes, or 360 up to now, that was our new number of tubes, times the area of the tube calculated in the previous page 686. So this is the area of the tube that we calculated previously, times the total number of tubes that we said we will employ based on our modifications of the velocity. So we have a value of 100, 07.7 meters square. So we can calculate the uh, overall heat transfer coefficient required. And the overall heat transfer coefficient required is the duty that we calculate in step number one, you remember? Uh, divided by the area that we just calculated now for the total number of tubes of 360 times delta T log that we calculated also in the very early steps of this design. We have a value required of the overall heat transfer coefficient of 197. So if you see the estimated overall heat transfer coefficient is well above that, that required for the design, right? You have to compare this value versus this value. 302 versus 197, there's a typo here, guys. Uh, which gives a scope for reducing the shell side pressure drop, right? We can change the pressure drop. So we have a space for changing the pressure drop in the shell side, so let's do it. Again, we are going to allow a drop of 0.1 bar for the shell inlet and outlet nozzles, leaving 0.7 bar for the shell side flow. So similar what we did for the tubes, right? Uh, so to keep within a specification, uh, the shell side velocity will be reduced uh, to around uh, a square root of one half, that is 0.7. Um, to achieve this, the baffle spacing will be increased to 100, uh, that is the baffle spacing that we already proposed. This was in page 687, uh, divided by this value of the reduction, right? the reduction value that we specified in here as the square root of one half. Uh, this will be around 141. So this is a way you can do these calculations to get approximated numbers. And again, this depends on you. Uh, you can put uh, 140 millimeters, uh, 142 millimeters. Um, I think 140 is a really good selection here based on the number we are getting here. Um, again, we do a recalculation of the area, right, with equation 1221. So we are recalculating what we calculate in previous page. Uh, we have, uh, again, here the two pitch, the outer diameter, the pitch again. Here is the shell inside diameter and the baffle spacing of 140. 
Uh, this gives me an area of 0.167 meters squared, so we can get the velocity, right? The velocity um, uh, is going to be the flow rate divided by the area that we just calculated in here. Again, with this velocity, we can recalculate the Reynolds number. We can recalculate the H value of the shell, the delta P of the shell, and we can recalculate this overall heat transfer coefficient here. Um, so, as you see, we are repeating all these uh, all these calculations. The delta P of the shell. Uh, now we are around 0.47 bars. And the new value of the overall heat transfer coefficient required is around 288. So we are within range, guys. The next step would be to estimate cost, and that is a completely different chapter in the textbook. Uh, next step uh, would be optimization. Uh, so there is a scope for optimization that is designed by reducing the number of tubes as the pressure drops are within, within a specification, right? Um, and the overall heat transfer coefficient is well above that needed. However, the method used for estimating the coefficient and pressure drop on the shell size, the current method is not accurate. So keeping to, design, to this design will give some margin of safety. So let's check then the correction factor for the viscosity and is why we didn't include the correction factor, right? In our equations, specifically, it was in the equations, um, in the equations for the H values, if I remember correctly. So the viscosity factor, um, this factor of the viscosity divided by viscosity of the wall or the surface to the point 0.14 was neglected when calculating the heat transfer coefficients and pressure drop. Uh, this is reasonable for kerosene as it has a relatively low viscosity, but it's not so obvious for the crude oil. So before filming up the design, the effect of this factor on the tube side coefficient and pressure drop will be checked. So first, an estimate of the temperature of the wall is needed. So we have here the inside area of the tubes calculated with the inside diameter of the tube, the length of the tube, and the number of tubes finally that we decide for. So we have a tube inside area or 83 meters squares. We can get the flux. The flux is the duty or the heat transfer rate divided by the area, right? And we have the duty already. So as a rough approximation, um, we are employing here Newton's cooling law, right? This is Newton's cooling law. If you see, this is the flux, that is heat transfer rate divided by area H delta T. We are just putting the area in the denominator here of the Newton's cooling law, right? So we can get the temperature of the wall from Newton's cooling law, um, where T is the bulk fluid temperature of 59. So we get a T wall of 86 Celsius. So we can read the viscosity then at T wall, the T wall calculated from Newton's cooling law. And uh, we have the correction factor of around one. So as you can see, it's a very small correction factor. So the decision to neglect the viscosity is justified. However, uh, you might not be able to see this in the beginning, like the book is presenting it, right? So maybe this is something that you want to do in the beginning, to check if really, because here, as you can see, it's almost one, so it doesn't matter if we multiply, right, by, by one hour correction, but maybe you will have some other fluids where this uh, correction of the viscosity becomes important. So the decision is justified, so we don't have to do the correction. But again, this is something that you might want to check, guys. Um, finally, typically we put everything in a table or in uh, bullets, like you can see here, with the summary of the proposed design after all our iterations. So we stick with a split ring, floating head, one shell pass, four two passes. With 360 carbon steel tubes, are meter long, 19.01 millimeters, outer diameter, 14.83 millimeters, inner diameter, triangular pitch of 23.618 millimeters. Heat transfer area of 107 meters square based on the outside diameter, the shell diameter, the baffle spacing, the cut of the baffles, the tube side heat transfer coefficient for clean, a shell side heat transfer coefficient for clean, 
Overall coefficient, dirty. Overall coefficient required, so this is the required and estimated, dirty, dirty. The fooling factors where these were given um, and the pressure drops. Um, that was finally specified uh, or are within the specification of the point eight overall. So this is what you need to do for your design problem. Again, um, uh, follow more or less this method. Obviously, you will have to do different iterations, maybe in different steps of the method. And I want to conclude this part on heat exchangers by sharing this article um that i found interesting in a magazine of about how to avoid the top 10 heat exchanger mistakes and this was presented by a company that has more than 40 years of experience in designing and, ex and installing heat exchanger that is hrs heat exchangers engineers and what they mark as the top 10 mistakes is excessive fooling and uh <clears throat> Well, they said that excessive fooling um, within a heat exchanger can range from minor inconvenience to just a catastrophic failure. Excessive fooling operation can also reduce operational efficiency and increase energy uh, consumption. There can be many reasons behind this, the excessive fooling. For example, food products contain high levels of protein that can cause a heat exchanger fooling, as those contain certain starches or enzymes. Um, in waste management situations, fooling from lime, lime scales to rewrite and be bite can be specifically problematic. The best solution to avoid excessive fooling in the first place is choosing the right type of heat exchanger for your application. Also, go maintain the correct temperature range to avoid right additional uh, additional uh, um, fooling and um, since uh, you might need to do acid dosing or cleaning with chemicals. Uh, something very important is the ground material choice. And I like to match what their point of view on this because sometimes we think that it's better to use cheap materials, but at the end, uh, using cheap materials might be most costly. And they are giving the example of the carbon steel. So bear in mind that cheaper isn't necessarily the best. The problem caused by specifying the ground type of material for your heat exchanger range from the need of additional cleaning to catastrophic failure of the unit. For example, carbon steel is cheaper than stainless steel and easier to work with, making it a popular choice for those on a budget. It is also more vulnerable to corrosion and chemical reaction. Thicker tubes walls are required compared to stainless steel which increases the weight of comparable heat exchanger units and may add to associated costs, such as concrete bases and mounting brackets. Also, carbon steel is brittle. And while it might have a higher thermal conductivity than other materials, this can rapidly regrade by the build-up corrosion of fulling layers, reducing the service life. If possible, offer a material which is both hygienic and hard wearing but which also provides good thermal characteristics in the design of the heat exchanger that you are considering, such as stainless steel. Incorrect pressure drop. So that still seems to be a problem out there, the pressure drop. And um, so it's something that you need to be very careful with. So pressure drop problems usually occur when the pressure drop in the heat exchanger is higher than the design parameters. In the worst scenario, this can lead to leaks, contamination, or heat exchanger failure. So as you saw in our problem example is what we spend the most time on, on checking that pressure drop, right? So um, that's something you need to check. Uh, poor location is another, is another, uh, another top, top 10 um, challenge or problem in designing heat exchangers. And it says that typically we, we find um, heat exchangers in corners obstructed by pipe work or other equipment. So we don't give the importance to the uh, heat exchangers that they need, especially because you need to have in mind that you need to have access for cleaning them and giving them maintenance. And sometimes because uh, we put them in corners or spaces, tight spaces, um, we just forget about that equipment and don't give the, them the needed, um, the needed maintenance. Um, 
If you are on tight space, ensure you specify a heat exchanger suitable for a small footprint. For example, corrugated tube designs are more efficient and require less space than a smooth tube units with the same capacity. Why? Because you're increasing the area with all the corrugated, right? Um, this means that they can often be housed in smaller spaces or novel locations, such as especially construct mezzanine, while still allowing full access for cleaning and maintenance. Insufficient capacity. Um, while it may be tempting to invest in a smaller unit to save money, this can prove a false economy. Specify a heat exchanger which is not large enough to cope with the maximum volume or processing capacity can result in extended running hours or in worst case scenario, having to run business away. One option may be to choose modular solution so that additional units can be added for when extra capacity is required. Although allowing for additional space and infrastructure may be incur some cost, this is likely to be less than a much larger over specified unit and will save money in the long term when expansion is required. So you always have to think about that, right? If you need to, uh, to add uh, more modules or increase production. Another important problem is product damage. And um, as you can see, um, well, we have a picture in the next, uh, in the next slide. So this is inappropriate product handling can easily affect the quality parameters such as taste, appearance, or viscosity. Such issues can occur from thermal or physical treatment or both. Common examples include rough handling or cream causing curdling, pizza sauce lost in its viscosity, so that it falls off the pizza, fats and spread becoming demulsified, and fruit juices losing their fresh taste when pasteurized. All of these effects and more could have been prevented by using the right heat exchanger in the first place. For example, not only are scraped surface heat exchangers good at preventing fooling with viscous products, they can also handle sauces more gently than a turbulent design, retaining the all important product characteristics. Another important problem is the lack of backup safety systems. And that's, I, I didn't expect to see this problem, and it says that uh, essentially when the pump fails, um, you have to ensure that you have an alarm system or an extra pump that can keep uh, your heat exchanger working. Otherwise you will have your hot or cold uh, temperatures long time, so you will spoil all your product. So <clears throat> is what is talking about this. So if pump fails as well as well in the system, material may remain for too long in the heat exchanger, becoming too hot or too cold. So um, it's recommended to have an extra line for the heat exchangers and also alarm systems. Mm, insufficient cleaning or maintenance, and we already talked about this uh, in poor location, but essentially, uh, this talks about um, the possible contamination because of the improper maintenance of heat exchangers. Uh, poor energy efficiency, so the potential for heating and uh, generation or product to product heat transfer should not be overlooked when designing your heat exchanger system. As, is, as in most cases, there will be some heat or cooling effect left over in the service fluid after it has passed through the heat exchanger. So using a design that reuses or regenerates this heat will reduce overall energy and running cost. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting point there. And finally, very important, and here are some pictures of fully, as you can see. Um, and we have seen some in class like this, but this in the left side is due to the ground material selection. So this leads to excessive corrosion and failure of the unit. And this kind um, of fooling is because, uh, or this happened, uh, the failure of this heat exchanger happened because it was not properly clean on time. So <laughs> finally, the incorrect design parameters. And it's what we have been working so far in the, in the course. Um, 
we don't follow the allowed pressures or the allowed temperatures for the fluids or the products we are treating in the heat exchanger. So um, those are the top 10 uh, guys, and I thought it was important for you to have them in mind. How often you should clean a heat exchanger? That depends completely on the process. Um, and obviously in food and pharmaceutical applications, the cleaning is much more often than whatever you expect in a petroleum industry, for example. So those are the top 10. Um, now, so I think we already complete the design. 